Matt Ross, WBAF Local News at 11 o'clock. The outlook for Kansas City, sunny and mild. Flood waters from the rising Big Arkansas River swept into rural and urban areas north and south of Wichita Sunday, causing the evacuation of many families. At Mulvane, Kansas, south of Wichita, at least 25 families were evacuated from their homes as the water continued to rise. Affected were from 75 to 100 residents. It's been a relatively safe weekend this far on Kansas roads. Just one highway death reported in Kansas since the weekend counting period began at 6 o'clock Friday night. In Missouri, nine persons have been killed so far this weekend. Five of the deaths involve motorcycles. Missouri legislators return to work tomorrow anxious to resolve a deadlock on the state's $2 billion budget. For some senators, it could be the last time they return to Jefferson City for a while. WDAF News Time, 11 o'clock. <laughs> the hour from American Information Radio. This is George Caldwell from New York, and at this hour, Chairman Peter Redino of the House Impeachment Committee says he doubts President Nixon would be cited for contempt of Congress, even if the President does withhold some evidence subpoenaed by the committee. On ABC's Issues and Answers, Republican Senator Charles Percy of Illinois says the President already is headed for a dangerous confrontation with Congress. Percy says the President may be obstructing justice by holding back evidence. Democratic Representative Shirley Chisholm has changed her mind about chances the president will be impeached. In Kansas City this afternoon, Chisholm told newsmen... I do think there are enough votes now. About three weeks ago, I would say no. But again, I am noticing the change in the attitudes of some of the most conservative members and some of the lifelong allies of the President of the United States. And when that begins to happen, you re recognize that there is an erosion of confidence. And so I think that we do have the votes at this moment. Representative Chisholm said the President's tax case turned the tide for impeachment. The fight for Mount Hermon. That story coming up. Pollution, crime, substandard housing, energy crisis, corruption, inequality, vandalism. If you don't like these conditions, you can do something about it. Law Day, May 1st, reminds us that the great thing about our system is that people can have a voice in improving it if they understand it and if they use that voice in the many ways possible. Through involvement, like helping to register voters, campaigning for candidates, voting. People of all ages can work to bring about change lawfully. But with almost half the population under 25, youth can make the difference. Learning what can be done and how should begin at an early age. Law Day urges young America to lead the way. Help preserve good laws. Help change bad laws. Help make better laws. A public service message of the American Bar Association and your state and local bar associations. Military officials in Tel Aviv say they don't have any information to support reports that Israeli soldiers moved into Lebanon today. Arab newsmen on the scene say an Israeli force took positions on the edge of Mount Hermon in southern Lebanon. Syria says its troops attacked 10 Israeli positions on the other side of Mount Hermon. Earlier today, correspondent Jem Bennett was on Mount Hermon. At least for a few hours, the Israelis who have tenaciously held on to this position in the face of very heavy shelling by the Syrians are not about to be pushed off. Their spirits remain high. Uh, they're a happy people, a happy group of soldiers. I don't see any dispiritedness among them. The plateau stretches out in a green carpet for miles. From here, I can see Damascus. I can see uh, into Lebanon. And it's the control of this mountain that gives the Israelis the advantage in the Golan Heights. This is Jim Bennett, ABC News, atop Mount Hermon. Newsweek magazine says the FBI has turned up valuable new leads in the Hearst case. Newsweek says numerous undercover agents have infiltrated the neighborhood where the Sambianese Liberation Army was headquartered and may actually have found the house where Patricia Hearst was taken. Tornadoes hit three counties of eastern Wisconsin this afternoon, killing two people and injuring at least 36. Police Captain Don Utak tells what a twister did in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Well, it did quite a bit of damage. There were some areas that are residential and some are commercial areas. Broke windows, tore roofs off. Some of the homes uh, were torn apart completely. And it seemed to touch down and raise up and skip uh, an area and then touch down again. Utak said there were about 20 injuries in Oshkosh. One man is reported dead because of flooding along the Suez River in the southern part of North Dakota. About 3,000 people have been evacuated from their homes in the North Dakota flooding. 
On Broadway tonight, the Tony Award for Best Play went to the River Niger. Best Musical is Raisin. Best Actress in a Musical, Virginia Capers in Raisin. And the Tony for Best Actor, Michael Moriarty for Find Your Way Home. This is Information Radio News. From the Kurt Murr Sports Desk, the Chicago White Sox scored seven times in the sixth inning and went on to an 11-7 victory over the Kansas City Royals today. The highlight was Brian Downing's bases loaded triple. Downing also homered. John Mayberry had a two-run homer for the Royals, while Tony Soleda added a solo shot. California's Lee Stanton hit a three-run homer to cap a six-run rally in the eighth inning and lead the Angels to a 9-5 victory over the Oakland A's. The uprising came against three Oakland pitchers, Vita Blue, Raleigh Fingers, and Darrell Knowles. Stanton's homer was his fourth of the season. A three-run double by Mike Phillips and a tie-breaking single by Steve Ontiveros in the eighth inning boosted the San Francisco Giants to a 6-4 triumph over the Los Angeles Dodgers. The Dodgers' Andy Misser-Smith entered the frame with a four-hitter and a 4-1 to lead before the Giants exploded for five runs. Chris Speer drove in the final run of the inning with a single. Veteran Joanne Prentice sang a three-foot, or rather sank a three-foot putt to defeat Jane Blaylock today on the fourth playoff hole to win the title in the Dinah Shore Winner's Circle Golf Tournament. Miss Prentice, an 18-year veteran of the tour with four prior victories, hold her birdie putt after Miss Blaylock's attempt at a 12-foot birdie went beyond the hole. She collects $32,000 for winning this richest ladies' tournament in history. And Chris Effort won her ninth consecutive clay court title today by methodically crushing Australian Carrie Melville, 6 to nothing, 6 to one Miss Everett takes home $10,000 for her victory in the tourney at St. Petersburg, Florida. The Kansas City forecast for the remainder of tonight, mostly fair and cooler. The low tonight in the upper 40s. Partly sunny and mild tomorrow with a high in the upper 60s. Fair and cool Monday night with a low in the 40s. Tuesday, mostly sunny and warmer with a high around 70. Currently clear skies, calm winds, the humidity 58%, and 60 degrees in Kansas City. This is Pat Ross, WDAF News. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... terrifying world of your own imagination. I have an unusual story about foreign intrigue, murder, and love. Interesting combination. You know, that great mystery writer Edgar Allan Poe once wrote that the best way to hide something was to leave it in full sight. And that's what this story is about. Steve Nash, agent for the Federal Narcotics Bureau, was awakened from a sound sleep by his chief. Steve, Manny and LaFaro got it tonight. Wounded? Dead. Oh, no. Manny's wife just had a baby. She's still in the hospital. Start packing a bag right now, Steve. Am I going somewhere? Paris. And anywhere else you feel it necessary to go from there. Paris? I don't get happy. It's not exactly a vacation, Steve. You're in for plenty of trouble. Our mystery drama, Conspiracy to Defraud, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sidney Sloan and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal, and by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Ever had a tall, frosty glass of amplitude? Well, if your beer is Budweiser, you've had it often. Amplitude is a fancy word for the entire taste phenomenon, the total experience of flavor. Next time you take a healthy swallow of Bud, watch what happens. Think about the sensations you're experiencing. Notice how the flavor of Bud comes on nice and easy. Not too strong, not too quick, just right. Notice the clean, crisp togetherness of Bud's taste. Everything in perfect balance, with no single element jumping out at you. And there'll be no aftertaste either, no hanging on. And you'll be refreshed and ready for another glassful. 
Actually, butt drinkers have been experiencing amplitude for years. But they never phrase it that way. They just say, Budweiser. And that says it all. Anheuser-Busch. St. Louis. Hello, this is Steve Allen. You are? Then I must be Jane Meadows. I hope so. <laughs> uh, now, do you want to tell them, darling, or shall I? Ladies first, sweetheart. The microphone's okay. all yours. Hey, Well, we have some good news. Steve and I are the honorary chairman of National Goodwill Week. That's May 5th through the 12th. Mm -hmm. And we're very pleased to be associated with this organization. Yes. Because it's the number one rehabilitation facility in the country. You see, Goodwill believes in people, and its business is helping the handicapped help themselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, Steve, with most of us these days devoting a good portion of our time combating the energy crisis, we tend to forget about the battle that um, handicapped people face every day just to survive. Very true. But that's where Goodwill Industries comes in. It offers them a chance to learn a trade earn a living, and regain their self-respect. Yes. Well, our time's about up, Jane, so remember, folks, be good to goodwill. Especially during the week of May 5th through the 12th. police and the Federal Narcotics Bureau believe to be a well-planned and secret bust of a big narcotics ring is taking place in a warehouse district of New York City. Stand by, Sergeant. I'm going to talk to them on a bullhorn. If they don't come out, we go in. Right, I got it. You are completely surrounded. I repeat, you are completely surrounded. Come on with your hands behind your head and we will not fire. Come out with your hands behind your head, and you will not be harmed. Keep the windows covered. I'm going to blast the lock on the door. That's got the door. Let's go. Uh, looks like there's nobody here. Careful, it might be a trap. This is your last chance. Come out with your hands behind your head. Cover me. Hit the lights. Wait a minute. There's a the body. Careful. Yeah. Careful. Chief, it's Manny. He's dead. Manny. The Faro may be here, too. He's here, Chief. Still alive? No. Dead. They got him, too. Yeah. This is Borden, Steve. Yeah, Chief, what's up? Manny and LaFaro got it tonight. Wounded? Dead. Oh, no. Manny's wife just had a baby. She's still in the hospital. I haven't spoken to her yet. Talk to Mrs. LaFaro. Took it hard, eh? I hate this job. Steve, you're a good friend of Manny's. Would you talk to his wife for me? Sure, I'll go to the hospital first thing in the morning. Rotten business. I uh, better start packing a bag right now, Steve. Oh, am I going somewhere? Paris. And anywhere else you feel it necessary to go from there. <laughs> Beg your pardon? Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, what? Uh, the seat. Seat? Oh, I'm sorry. Am I in the wrong seat? No, I am. Oh. <laughs> you see, I was sitting forward, the second row on the outside. Yeah? And I asked the stewardess to change my seat. This was the only unoccupied seat in first class. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, sit down. I don't mind. I thought this was going to be a dull flight. <laughs> my name is Helene Frey. Oh, I'm Steve Nash. Uh, pleased to have you as a traveling companion. I'm pleased, too. I... Are you going to be in Paris long, Mr... Uh, Nash, uh, call me Steve. So seldom I get called Mr. I'm not sure whether I'm the one. <laughs> Steve, then. Are you going to be in Paris long? Well, it all depends on business. Are you? No. No, I was rushing back to... 
Well, you see, my aunt and my brother are in Paris, and I was with them until last Thursday when I had to fly back to New York. Up and back across the Atlantic. Mm. I'm impressed. <laughs> this is my first time over. I'm as excited as a kid. Your first time? Yeah. Well, that must be exciting. You must let us show you the sights. Nothing I'd like better, Elaine. Entrez. Inspector Boivin? Oui. You are uh, Stephen Nash, a Federal Narcotics Bureau? <laughs> That's right. Entrez. <laughs> come in, come in, please. I have been expecting you. Uh, may I say that uh, we are not uh, pleased by this visit? I'm sorry, I didn't set it up. Oh, it is not personal, you understand. But uh, we feel that France is, uh, how shall I say it, uh, is being insulted by the charges that we are the center of the illicit narcotics trade in Europe. Inspector, a lot of heroin is getting into the States. We know it's coming from France. Well, that is doubtful. In the last six weeks, we have intercepted and destroyed over 100 pounds of refined heroin coming into New York alone. From France? Definitely. Three men from my department have died in the operation, and that is no exaggeration. Well, as you say, it is uh, foolish for me to fence with you. That is not my job. As I understand it, Inspector, your job is not to question nor to argue. Your job is to cooperate. And that was the information handed down to my boss from the State Department. You may be assured of our cooperation. <laughs> Entree. The door is open. Oh, hello. You must be the chap Helene picked up on the plane. Uh, picked up? Oh, well, that's just a figure of speech, of course. I, I'm Harrington Frame, Helene's brother. Oh, hi. I'm Steve Nash. Yes. Well, hello. Hello. Sit down. Sit down. Helene should be back in a minute. Just stepped out to do a bit of last-minute shopping. Uh, that you, Helene? Oh, Auntie... This is that chap that Helene met on her flight back, Mr. Stephen Nash. This is our Aunt Phyllis, the Mrs. Starrow. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Nash? How do you do, Mrs. Starrow? Oh, please, please, call me Phyllis. Mrs. Starrow reminds me of that I'm an old widow woman. Are you going to be in Paris long, Stephen? Oh, uh, two, uh, three weeks, perhaps longer. Auntie thinks of herself as an unofficial tourist bureau, feels she must take her fellow countrymen under her wing and show them her Paris. Oh, you be quiet. <laughs> I just want to be pleasant. Don't you like people who are pleasant, Steve? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> I don't suppose that Harrington or Helene has told you of our trouble. Oh, good Lord, Phyllis, must you tell everyone you meet... Mr. Nash has only been here a few minutes, and you want to burden him with the story. Well, I must say, it's rather a traumatic experience, wouldn't you say, Stephen? To, to lose emeralds worth $150,000. $150,000? <laughs> Oh, that must be Helene. Uh, let her in, Harrington. Phyllis is angry with me. She always calls me Harrington when she's annoyed. Oh, Helene. Is Mr. Nash here yet? Oh, indeed, yes. Phyllis and I have been staging a little domestic spat to keep him amused. Well, I wasn't amused. And I'm sure that this nice Mr. Nash wasn't amused either. I'm certain he wasn't. Hello, Steve. <laughs> Helene. Sorry I was late and allowed my abrasive brother and aunt to put on a show for you. <laughs> I enjoyed every moment, Helene. <laughs> Penny, for your thoughts, Steve. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have let the Mater D seat us here in the window with a view of Notre Dame and the river. Mm. It is beautiful, isn't it? I was worried that perhaps you might feel that I'd steered you to a tourist trap. This place is frightfully expensive, you know. <laughs> it's great. I'm on an expense account. Stop worrying. <laughs> All right, I shall. And uh, speaking of worry... You seem to have something bothering you. Is it something personal? Well, it's about my aunt and Harrington. Yeah? Well, you see, my aunt has lost a very valuable piece of jewelry. Uh, the emeralds. You know. One of the first things she told me when I called worth $100,000 or more. They're insured for 120000 Why should she worry? She's not worrying. I am. The emeralds are not lost, strayed, or stolen. What? Uh -huh. 
It's just a stunt to bilk the insurance company. Well, she's being very foolish. She's desperate. She's completely without money. For that matter, both Harrington and I are, too. If they go through with this insurance swindle, they're going to be in big trouble. Even a professional crook would have serious problems in there. Rank amateurs. When I went back to New York to see if I could raise some money... Oh, no good, eh? Aunt Phyllis has been to the well too often. No credit. Well, why doesn't she sell the emeralds, honestly? Well, I believe it's Harrington's idea, but he wants her to sell them to a... Well, some... Uh... Defense? Yes. And also collect the insurance. He's made several tentative moves in that direction. He's spoken to several mysterious callers. I don't know how far the transaction has gone. Taxi! Taxi! I can find you a taxi, monsieur. What? You uh, want a taxi? I can get one for you. Uh, no, no, thanks, sir. <laughs> what a town. Even the taxi drivers have agents. <laughs> You will not make a move, monsieur. It is a revolver that is pressing into your back. Oh. Uh, perhaps you underestimated your strength, Gab. The blow on the head... No, he'll be all right. We dropped her at the Concord. That is the hotel where she is staying, is it not? Yes. Uh. Uh, Nash, uh, can you hear me? Uh, ah, you are opening your eyes. Uh, that is better. Oh, my head. Unfortunately, Geb found it necessary to uh, <laughs> persuade you to come with him. Uh, yeah. It's a neat little persuader he used. Right in the back of my head. Thanks. Uh, don't try to move yet, Mr. Nash. Who are you? I? You do not know me? I am quite well known. I am Orestes Collaginos. Uh, rings no bells. Why should you try to make me come here? Wait a minute. Uh, where, where is she? What, what have you done with her? Compose yourself, Mr. Nash. I take it you are referring to Miss Elaine Friend? Where is she? Back at her hotel. I had her sent back immediately. We did not want to speak to her. Just you. Okay. You have the floor, Mr. Colladanus. Uh, Colladinus, Monsieur Nash. It is an old name. In my country, a revered name. I'll do my best to remember. Well, continue. A uh, question, Monsieur. Why are you in France? As we say at home, none of your business. <laughs> I like you, Monsieur Nash. You are refreshingly candid. You are working for FNB. You are a trusted, intelligent worker. Well thought of. Thanks for the information. When I get back, I'll put in for a raise. If you get back, monsieur. If you get back. There is no doubt in Steve's mind that Kaladinos would and could carry out his threat. Three men had already been permanently silenced. And it was not likely that Colladinus would hesitate at the fourth. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Great taste in the morning. Kellogg's, Kellogg's has that wholesome taste to get you up and grinning. This is Jerry Coffer for Kellogg's Special K. You know, for years we've been talking about the Special K breakfast, a great way to start the day if you have a weight problem. You may have seen or heard our latest commercials, which symbolize the problem of being a few pounds overweight by using this ball and chain. That's the sound effect. But so many people have come to know the Special K breakfast that can help solve weight problems, they sometimes forget that Special K is America's favorite high-protein cereal. It has eight essential vitamins and iron, and so delicious that lots of folks, kids as well as adults, eat Special K just for the sheer good taste of it. So we don't want you to think that you have to wear a ball and chain to eat Special K. All you need is an appreciation for the finer things of life, a one-ounce bowl of Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, coffee, and maybe a little sugar. The Special K breakfast can help you lose weight all by itself, but it really is a good start. The Marine Corps Reserves are looking for a few good men to help keep the peace. 
We're looking for men who understand that nobody likes to fight, but somebody has to know how. We want men who want to see their children grow up in an age of peace. Men who will do more than wish for it. Men who will work for it. Men who don't need the draft to know there's a job to be done. Men who ask themselves what they can do for their country and do it. We're looking for a few good men to stand with the Marine Corps Reserve. No shortcuts, no compromises, no promises except one. You'll be a Marine and you'll be ready. That's the job of a peacekeeper. After his meeting with Kaladinos, Steve was taken back to his hotel. It was too late to do anything but call Elaine to reassure himself of her safety. It may have occurred to him that his feelings for her were more than that of a casual friend. And the sound of her voice on the phone convinced him of her personal concern for his safety. Steve, you're safe. Oh, I was so worried. They told me that you'd been driven back to your hotel, but I wanted to be sure. I saw that man hit you. Uh, there was a car waiting. and I, I, He forced me into the car, and they dragged you in. Oh, you were so white, I thought... <laughs> With my hard head, you needn't have wore it. I'll tell you all about it when I see you. Well, when? When will I see you? Oh, there's so many things to ask you. I I'm sorry, I can't tell you what time. I'll call you again. Okay, Steve. Till then. Bye. Bye, darling. Ridiculous. Incroyable, monsieur. It could not have occurred. I tell you, he told me that his name was Colladina. It could not be he. It is a, uh, how do you say, imagination, hallucination. This lump on my head is not the result of a vivid imagination, Inspector. And also, I have a witness. I was with a Miss Helene Frayne when the incident occurred. Frayne? Frayne is an English name? Uh, possibly English in origin, but she's an American. She has a husband by name Arrington Frayne? No, that's her brother. Ah, this is a most interesting development. Monsieur Frayne was here not 20 minutes before you to report that his aunt, Madame Philistero, had been robbed of a valuable collection of emeralds. I believe he estimated the jewels to be worth... Um, I have the report here. Uh, ah, yes, 700,000 francs. In dollars, 150,000. Uh, look, Inspector, let's stay with my problem. Now, what are you going to do about Colladinos? Do? But you are jesting, Monsieur. Monsieur Colladinos is a very rich, a very powerful man. And so he can get away with, with hitting a man over the head and forcibly detaining him, kidnapping him, threatening him? Monsieur Colladinos could not have been involved in this matter. What do you mean? I spoke to him. He introduced himself. He insisted that I pronounce his name correctly. It was not Colladinos, monsieur. Who was it then? I mean, what was this man's purpose in posing as Colladinos? That, monsieur, I cannot answer. But I know that it could not have been Colladinos. He is just at this time, 1900 hours, arriving in France at Orly Airport in his own plane. <laughs> You... you kissed me. Surprise you? No. I was sort of expecting you to kiss me. Uh, don't you think we ought to shut the door? <laughs> I wanted to take you in my arms 20 minutes after we met on the plane. I wanted you to 13 minutes after we... Oh. Oh, damn, let's ignore it. Yeah, you better answer it. Oh, dear. Yes? Yes, he's here. Steve, it's for you. New York calling. Oh, yeah, I left word at my hotel where I was going to be. Here, darling. Oh, thanks. Hello? 
Steve, this is Hal Gordon in New York. All right, Chief. You got my cable? Yeah, and I have all the info you requested, but I can't give it to you where you are. Incidentally, where are you? Oh, Suite 1013 at the Concord Hotel. It's all right, it's a friend. All right, now go to the railroad station. Garden Nor. Near the ticket window on the south side of the station, you see a line of ten telephone booths. Counting from left to right, you go to booth three at three o'clock your time. You better get to it 15 minutes early to be sure it's available. Now, wait a minute, Chief. Let me see if I got it all. Guard to north, three o'clock, third booth on the south side of the station, counting from the left. Correct. Why all these precautions, Chief? Steve, you are being watched, followed, bugged 24 hours of the day. Don't trust anyone. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye, Chief. Well... What was that all about? Oh, it's nothing. It's the business I'm in, Elaine. Oh, it sounds very mysterious. Rushing off to the guard you know to receive a phone call at 3 o'clock in booth 3. Oh, I almost forgot. What? When I came into the hotel just now, the clerk at the desk, he gave me a message for you. Hang on, I got it here someplace. For me? Oh, I think it's for your brother. <laughs> what did I do with it? Ah, oh, darn it. Well, don't be upset. It's probably nothing oh, important. Hang on, hang on. I can remember it. It was very short. Just call El Moray. What? Yeah, it was uh, sound sort of Arabic. El Moray. E-E-L-M-O-R-E-Y. Did you ever hear of it before? I oh, know. Uh, maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> you seem a bit upset when I mention it. Well, I was, actually. I... I think it's the man Harrington has been trying to contact. What about the sale of the emeralds? Yes. We've had several calls. I've heard him deep in muffled conversation on the phone at least three times in the last week. Elaine, you can't let them... You've got to help me. I'm desperate. I can't think how I can stop them. Except by going to the police, as you said. Oh, not that. No. Well, that would be the last resort. <laughs> Book along. Hello. 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 Hello, Steve. Yeah, Borden. Steve Nash. Steve, is that you? Yeah. Good. I'm glad you got to the booth early. I'm seven minutes and thirty-five seconds early. Now listen. We have reason to believe that we may be bugged right here at headquarters. Now, here's the info on Coladinas. He's a rich exporter of olives and olive oil. He's dabbled in other things, art, petroleum, some shipping. But mainly olives and olive oil, eh? Clean? Well, who knows? Then explain why he picked me up, brought me to this place, and gave me more than a gentle warning to get the hell out. I don't get it. He's reputed to be one of the richest men in Europe. Now, here's what I wanted to tell you. We have it on good authority that a very large shipment of raw opium came into Marseille yesterday. It'll take a few days to process, and then the refined product will be slipped out of France for here. Do the French know? They're just being told through official channels. We've asked them to check all personal baggage going out of France. Going out? Big order. I know. It's going to be tough to check. A lot will slip by. We'll have to try to spot it here. Wait a minute, Chief. What is it? Someone, someone just slipped into the booth next to mine. Public phone, Steve. Uh, this guy I recognize. Uh, you know what time it is on my watch? Exactly three. Yeah, but Steve, what is that character got to... I ran into on the street the other night. The one who let me have it on the back of the head. Don't you see? He's in the next booth, probably hooking up some sort of electronic device to listen in on us. He expected you there at three. Yeah, you were right. You were right about the phone being bugged. But we got the jump on him by several minutes because I was early. I won't hang up my phone, Chief. Stay on the phone. I'm going to get him. What? I got you, you little punk. Let me go. I'll call the police. Uh, you call the police. Good. Save me the trouble. But before they get here, I have a little something I owe you from the other night. <laughs> Are you quitting so soon? Come on, buddy boy. Don't play unconscious with me. Uh-oh. Looks like we're going to have some company. Hello. Uh, Chief, are you still there? Yes, Steve. What's going on? I just... 
I just nailed our eavesdropper. And I was right. He is one of Coladinas' boys. Now, you better get in touch with the French police and point the finger at Coladinas. And uh, while you're getting Coladinas into trouble with the police, you, you might tell them that they got me locked up. I, I don't think I'll be able to explain. Locked up? What are you talking about? You're not locked up. No. But by that time, I will be. Here comes the gendarme now. Bye, Chief. It is one thing to point the finger at Coladinos. It is another to pin him down. Coladinos is a man used to wielding great power. A very cunning and wily antagonist. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. Hello, this is Goldilocks. It seemed like only yesterday that I was a little girl tasting porridge. You know, this one's too hot. This one's too cold. And now I conduct taste tests on diet drinks. And there's one I must tell you about. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. It has a fresh, natural, delicious taste. It drives my taste meter crazy. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. <gasps> this one's just right. Hi, I'm Nanette Fabre. Eleven million Americans have an untreated hearing problem, including three million school-age kids. I was one of those kids, but I got help. Most hard of hearing people can be helped either medically or through amplification. There is a Better Business Bureau booklet that may help you, and it's free. Write Better Hearing Institute, Box 1840. That's 1840, Washington, D.C. You want to hear what you're missing. Your contributions to care have given help and hope to millions of needy people around the world. When they were hungry, you nourished them. When they were thirsty, you brought them safe water to drink. When they were sick, you made them well. When they were homeless, you provided them shelter. When they could not read, you helped build their school. When they were without hope, you showed them how to help themselves. CARE, the International Aid and Development Organization. By helping one human being anywhere, you help mankind everywhere. People who need CARE need your help. Please send your dollars to CARE, Department 2, New York, 10016. At times, Steve Nash's assignment has him feeling as though he's chasing phantoms. He keeps reaching out to grab something tangible and ends up with empty hands. After ten days in Paris, he is as much in the dark about the narcotics racket as he was before he came. Coladinos is probably deeply involved. But Coladinos is untouchable. You can close the cell door, guard. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being so prompt, Inspector. I didn't think I could stand your Bastille for another ten minutes. Monsieur Nash, we have received a call from your bureau in New York asking us to come here and release you. How they knew you had been arrested is a mystery. I told them on the phone. You called from here? Uh, no, no. When I was making a call to my chief in New York from a booth in the Gare du Nord. I still do not understand. I knew I was in trouble after I hit that man that Coladinos sent. Coladinos? He is becoming, how you say... An obsession. You still don't believe he was the man? No. And I do not wish to continue this useless conversation. You have been released. You may leave. Good day. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Inspector. What happened to the man I hit? He was treated for his injuries and sent home. Hey, let him go. He is Coladinos, man. He's the one who cracked me over the head and took... Monsieur, I will not listen to more from you. I am three years from retirement... And I am not stupid to jeopardize my pension. What's your pension got to do with this? What indeed? I have told you that Monsieur Coladinos is very important, very powerful. You're afraid of him. I would not exactly say that. Well, I would exactly say it. I think he's the fat butterfly I came here to catch. 
And I'm going to net him with your help or without it. Monsieur Nash. Monsieur Nash. Here. Well, Mr. Colladinus, fancy meeting you here. May I give you a lift? No, oh, thank you. My head still aches when I remember my last ride in your rolls. <laughs> Get in. We're tying up traffic parking here. Come on, you're perfectly safe. Okay, okay. Good. Drive on, Andre. Matter of fact, I was anxious to see you, Colladinos. Really? I am flattered. You wanted to say goodbye. Goodbye? Yes, because you are leaving Paris. Where did you get that information? I mean, how come I haven't heard? You will, monsieur. Uh, you will. And you are very lucky, you know. Go on. You are alive. Monsieur Nash, you have been walking in dangerous territory. And do you know why you have survived? Tell me. Because you have been completely ineffectual. Because you have discovered nothing in all the time you have been here. In fact, your superiors are of the opinion that you have wasted your time and your government's money. So I'm going home in disgrace. Friday afternoon. Flight 225 International. Suppose I decide to stay on until I've nailed you. That would be a very unfortunate decision. Learn to quit when you're ahead. You are ahead right now. Well, I want to thank you for everything. All the arrangements. Very neat. Very efficient. Thank you. And now I should like to drop you at your destination. My hotel? I was thinking, perhaps, that you would be going to the American Embassy. There to call your superior in New York, Chief Borden, and verify the information that I have given you. Borden here, Steve. Uh, right, Chief. I've been trying to reach you all day. I, uh... I haven't got good news for you. I know, I know. I'm coming home Friday. Sorry, Steve. I'm just following orders. Oh, don't bother to explain, Chief. Someone over here doesn't like me, that it? That's about it. Maybe because I'm getting close to something, beginning to press where it hurt. Well, if you want it straight, we got the info that you were having a big thing with a certain Miss Helene Freyne. Spending government bread on our fancy restaurants, things like that. Yeah, no mention of Orestes Colodinos in all the memos on me. No, not a thing. Marvelous. It's simply astounding how that overweight olive salesman can be everywhere at the same time. Wield influence strong enough to get our government to back down and still not show himself. Steve, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm not fired yet, am I? No, not yet. <laughs> It's nice to know where you stand. I'm still employed until Friday. That gives me three and a half days. I'll do what I can for you, Steve. Thanks, Chief. I knew you'd say that. Now listen, call on me for anything I can do from here, any time of the day or night. Here's my home number. Don't hesitate to call. It's 415-3132. Uh, hang on, hang on. Uh, I haven't got a pencil or a paper handy. Oh, just, listen, just remember the name McCauley. M-C-H-O-L-L-Y. That's how I remember all telephone numbers. I convert them to names. Oh, you use the letters on a telephone dial instead of the numbers? Yeah, it's an old trick. You remember, Steve? <laughs> Can't forget. McCauley. Okay, good luck, Steve. <laughs> Steve, darling. Hi, Helene. Oh, come in. Come in, let's shut the door. Oh, I called you all day yesterday. I left messages. I was in jail. Jail? Yeah, I ran into the buzzard who hit me that night. Oh, that night? Yeah, I was making that overseas call in the Gare du Nord when I noticed him getting into the booth next to mine. What a coincidence. Uh, that was no coincidence. Someone knew I was to be there at 3 o'clock and tipped him off. I hit him, and the gendarme... 
Say, you've been packing. Uh, are you leaving Paris? Well, that's what I wanted to tell you. We're flying to New York on Friday. Friday? I'm going back on Friday, too. Flight uh, 225 International. You're kidding. Oh, that's our flight. Oh, Steve, that's wonderful. Oh, we'll have six whole hours together. <laughs> Speaking of coincidence... I'm beginning to wonder if it is really that or if someone isn't programming my whole life to suit his own wishes. I don't understand you. Uh, I'm just talking to myself. Uh, you're going to be a wee bit overweight, Elaine. All these boxes and packing crates, are they going with you? <laughs> oh, heavens, no. We'll just carry suitcases. This will all be sent by freight. Oh, I see. Ship via SS Andreas... Bordeaux. Huh, is that a French ship, Elaine? Well, I wouldn't know. Harrington made all the arrangements. Oh, speaking of your brother, uh, how's his little swindle going? I'm afraid that it's all been settled. He sold it, eh? Well, he seems to have a great deal of money on him. And Auntie's out shopping at the most expensive couturier in Paris. What about you, Elaine? I couldn't do it, Steve. Couldn't turn them in. Oh, the whole thing's a mess. I feel helpless. Well, take heart. They may get caught yet. Wait till they try to collect. Oh, Phyllis. Oh, I am exhausted, utterly exhausted. One doesn't realize how tiring shopping for clothes can be. Oh, oh hello. You're Mr. Ro uh, Nash, uh, Mrs. Starrell. Oh, of course, of course. Nash, Philip Nash. Now, where did we meet, young man? Right here, Phyllis. Not more than ten days ago. And his name is Stephen, not Philip. Oh, yes. And? And? And, and he's the man I'm going to marry. If you'll have me. Will you, Steve? Will I? Darling, I thought you'd never ask. Hello? Chief, Steve. Uh, you know what time it is? Yes, 8 o'clock in the morning. Where you are here, it's just 2 o'clock in the morning. I just got to sleep an hour ago. I'm sorry, Chief. I had to call. It's urgent. Chief, I'm in Bordeaux. What the hell are you doing in Bordeaux? I'll explain it to you later. Just tell me this. You mentioned that Coladinos had varied business interests. Uh, one you mentioned in passing. Shipping? Yes, he has. He owns two ships, both under Liberian registry. He uses them mainly for his olive oil company. Would the name of one of them be the S.S. Andreas? Um, can't remember the names. The files are at the office. Well, I'll be in Paris in a few hours. Would you check and call me? You sound like you've latched onto something, Steve. I may have. I'll tell you about it when I see you. I'm flying home this afternoon, remember? Yeah. If I have anything, I'll have you to thank. Thanks for the tip, Macaulay. <laughs> Understand. I distinctly remember ordering all three tickets for first class. Now they tell me that we have two first and one tourist. Now don't get so worked up about it, huh? I suppose you expect me to sit in the tourist class seat? No, I shall. Being a martyr, Helene? No, but I'll have more charming company in tourists than you, dear brother. Ah, here he comes now. Nash, that's right. Phyllis said he'd be on this flight. Steve, over here. I'm sorry I'm a little late. I had to wait for a call from New York. Hello, Harrington. Hello. Please excuse me. I've got to find Phyllis. She's buying perfume in the duty-free shops. She'll never know what time it is. Don't be too long. They'll be calling our flight any minute. Oh, Steve, I missed you. Where have you been for the last two days? Oh, a few things to wrap up before I left Paris. I wanted to take a look at a little more of the country. I may not be back for years, <laughs> if ever. Well, why didn't you tell me? I'd have gone with you. Pardon, mademoiselle, monsieur. Oh, Inspector Boivin. Come to see us off, monsieur? Not exactly. Uh, mademoiselle, Madame Starro and Monsieur Harrington Frayne should also be present. Uh, they are here? They're here, Monsieur Boivin. My aunt is doing some last-minute shopping. Oh, uh, here they are. <laughs> I've had the most glorious time, Elaine. Oh, Miss Nash and Monsieur Boivin. Well, I'm afraid I'm way, way over my quota. I have bought some big gallons and gallons. Pardon, madame, but uh, 
We have very little time, and it is necessary that all your luggage be examined before you board. Be examined? At this end? We're going out, not coming in. I am sorry, monsieur. Regulations, if you will be so kind. Regulations? Since when? Tuesday this week. All luggage must be examined before departure. Ah, red tape, bureaucratic red tape. If you'd stop arguing, we'd be through it in a matter of minutes. Quiet, Harrington. Now, Monsieur Boivin, where do we go? Please, be so kind as to follow me. Uh, you too, Monsieur Nash. Uh, through this door, please. Our bags are already on the plane. They were checked through. You will find that all your luggage is on that table, ready for examination. Now, the attendants will help you, but uh, we should like you to open your own luggage. Uh, who is first, dear? Uh, that's mine. Uh -huh. Open, please. Now, let us look inside the case containing your articles of toilet, monsieur. Mm. Uh -huh. This is toothpaste. Is this necessary, monsieur? Must you remove and examine everything in the case? Uh, 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 patience, monsieur. I know what I am looking for. This uh, tube is most interesting. Regard, it has been opened at the bottom and sealed again. When one presses firmly on the tube, one discovers that there are unnatural lumps within. <laughs> we shall see what they are. I take my pocket knife and... Uh, uh, there. These uh, are emeralds, wouldn't you say, madame? Yes, they are my emeralds. Now, would you be so kind as to give them to me? Uh, presently, madame. Uh, Monsieur Frayne, madame Starrow, you are under arrest. On what charge? Oh, my nephew did not steal my jewels. I gave them to him for safekeeping. You reported a theft, madame, a false theft. A mistake? A misunderstanding. We have found the emeralds, and now we report them found. You are in a conspiracy to defraud the insurance company, madame. That is a crime. No? You will both come with me? You, Nash. You did this, snooping around. I knew he was some sort of a cop, Phyllis. You are clear, mademoiselle. The attendants will see that your luggage is placed aboard the plane. So you finally decided to do it, eh, Elaine? Yes. I discovered that the emeralds hadn't been sold yet. Also, that Phyllis hadn't reported the loss to the insurance company. I knew the charges couldn't be too severe and would probably be dismissed. Of course, they'll probably never forgive you. Oh, I think they will in time. And I'll have you to console me, Steve. <laughs> they'll be calling our plane now. Too bad Phyllis and Harrington's tickets won't be used. Oh, look, there's Boivin. Huh, he's alone. I guess he sent them off to the Bastille. I don't envy them their visit. My experience was pretty bad. Will Mademoiselle Gillian Frey come to information, please? Oh, you're being paged, Elaine. Will I can't imagine what it is. Will come to oh, information, let's please? Let's find out. Come on. You have a message for me? Oui, madame. Elaine Frey? Yes. Ah, we. Oui. Oui, I have it here. Thank you. Merci. Well, what is it, Elaine? You look worried. Oh, nothing. Nothing, Steve. I, I, I've just got to make a telephone call that I neglected to. Uh, oh, oh, there's a booth over there. Do you want me to come with you? No, no. Wait for me here. E L M O R E Y. Yes? This is Elaine. I'm at the airport. I got your message. What message? The message of information. I was paged. What message? The usual. Call El Moray. You fool. You little fool. I sent no message. You've been trapped. You are caught. And so am I. They will be waiting when you come out of the booth. You have involved me, you stupid fool. Thank your American lover for this. 
You are under arrest, mademoiselle. Would you be so kind as to accompany me? Yes. Monsieur Nash, I leave the prisoner in your custody. Your plane is already boarding. You do not have much time. Thanks, Inspector. Steve, I... Don't cry. It can't change matters. Steve, I won't try to defend myself. You were planted on the plane I came over on, weren't you? Yes. This whole business of the stolen emerald was a diversionary move, eh? Harrington and Phyllis would be caught and the police satisfied with the capture. This would allow you to slip through? Yes. It's true. It's all true. We were the clearing house. The crates we sent to Bordeaux. I know, I know. Narcotics. The ship SS Andreas belongs to Coladinas. I checked it out. Sailed yesterday for New York. One dozen gallon tins in the cargo contain heroin. Not olive oil. They'll be found when the ship docks in New York. I've wired ahead. I'm sure you have. So this has all been a performance. A charming charade to throw dust in my eyes. No. No, that isn't entirely true. Come on, Elaine. It started that way, I admit. Please believe me. I love you. Mademoiselle? Yes, I'm ready. Goodbye, Stephen. Steve stood there and silently watched the woman he had just begun to love being led away by the French police. For long minutes after she disappeared through the main doors, he stood there without moving. Finally, with an effort, he responded to the last boarding call for flight 225. I'll be back shortly. Oh, sure. You can talk about good-tasting diet drinks, but I know. I'm Goldilocks, and here at my taste-testing laboratory, I taste-test them all. And nobody's been drinking my diet drinks until I tested sugar-free Diet 7-Up. And then, kabloomy, every bear wanted some. Diet 7-Up is fresh, natural, delicious. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up. This one's just right. Pollution, crime, substandard housing. Law Day, May 1st, reminds us that if we don't like these conditions, our system allows us to do something about it. Through involvement, like helping to register voters, campaigning, and voting, we all can help bring about change lawfully. With nearly half the population under 25, Law Day urges young America to lead the way. A public service message of the American Bar Association and your state and local bar associations. Steve Nash got off the plane in New York. His chief was waiting to congratulate him. But all the praise and promises of a promotion couldn't wipe out the last look on Helene's face. He knew it would stay with him forever. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Suzanne Grossman, Ruth Warwick, George Petrie, Leon Janney, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Jenny, that stone ain't gold. Then what is it? It's pyrite. What's pyrite? Oh, it's just what everybody calls... Well, it... Uh, it it's a sort of metal. Well, anyways, whatever it is, it's real precious to me. It's my lucky charm. Well, that's why you better not let Pa know what you think about it. Why? Well, you know what he's like. He, he cares about gambling more than he cares about anything, and all gamblers are real superstitious. Now, if he knew you had a lucky piece, especially if he heard the crazy story about you and the school burning down, he'd have it offer of you so fast that it'd set your head to spinning. It isn't crazy. You heard me wish on the stone for no school, and now there is no school. That was just happenstance. You don't think it happened just because I wished it? Of course it didn't. Then I'm going to prove it to you. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. 
Until next time, pleasant dreams. WDAF, Kansas City.